Good morning. Uh, may I call our proceedings to order at this rather early hour. Thanks so much for all of you for coming uh, out. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about administrative law and whether it's within the bounds of law this morning. And it's an important topic because, of course, modern government is administrative government. Uh, yet it's government that doesn't proceed, at least in what we learned in high school in our civics books. It's not uh, government uh, action uh, simply through uh, action of the legislature and simply ministerial action of the executive overseen very carefully by the Article III judiciary. In, co in contrast, real administrative government seems to give very large amounts of discretion uh, to the uh, executive, and that raises uh, serious questions about uh, how it keeps within the bounds of the law. And there's been a lot of ferment in administrative law. Uh, I think uh, on the one hand, we've seen a substantial push to actually increase uh, executive discretion. And to segue from our uh, previous panel uh, yesterday, uh, uh, we saw, in fact, uh, Jillian Metzger's very interesting <coughs> remarks justify some uh, presidential perspective declarations not to enforce the law for, from administrative values. Administrative values of the administrative state, transparency, those are justifications uh, for presidential declarations not to enforce the law. We've also seen a discussion of what's called in administrative law big waiver, the authority uh, given by Congress to some administrative agencies to waive statutes that Congress itself had passed. Uh, that's a, a new and uh, controversial idea uh, in administrative uh, law. On the, the other hand, I think we've seen also some uh, counter uh, of revolutionary sentiments in administrative law. In the dissent uh, in uh, Arlington versus FCC, uh, just Chief Justice Roberts not only expressed some concern about expanding Chevron uh, to the jurisdictional stage, but I think it can be fairly said that he expresses some disquiet about the administrative state in general, and uh, at least with respect to uh, our deference, the uh, idea that administrative agencies should get deference in interpreting their own rules, he's joined uh, by uh, Justice Scalia. So I think it's fair to say uh, I, I cannot think of a period where there has been more ferment and possible idea of change uh, in administrative uh, uh, law. Uh, and I'm very grateful that we have some very uh, uh, knowledgeable panelists uh, to speak about these changes, uh, both in practice and in theory. Uh, and uh, I'll just introduce them very briefly uh, in the order in which they're going to speak and then uh, get out of the way. They'll speak for around 10 minutes. They'll be interchanged between the panelists and then questions uh, from the audience. Uh, first, we're going to have Richard Pierce from uh, George Washington uh, University, uh, then uh, Philip Hamburger uh, from uh, Columbia uh, <coughs> University School of Law, uh, then uh, Kristen uh, uh, Hickman uh, from uh, the University of Minnesota School of Law, and finally, Michael Grieve from George Mason Law School. Uh, uh, with that, uh, Dick Pierce. <coughs> Thanks, John. I actually wasn't uh, able to attend yesterday's session, so I, I missed the, what I'm sure was a great discussion of uh, the issue I'm going to uh, discuss also today, and that's uh, uh, the legality of these uh, controversial actions that uh, the, the President Obama has taken in the context of the Affordable Care Act and immigration primarily. Um, and I really approach them with no dog in the, the fight at all. I, I don't much care, except as an academic. I think they're really fascinating. I think they're important. I think they're actually some very difficult issues. And all I'm going to do is just go over some of those issues, primarily with reference to the, the, the uh, precedents that bear on them. Each, each of these uh, actions, at least big chunks of them, have been characterized as deferrals. So for instance, in the ACA context, uh, there was the deferral of the employer mandate and the deferral of the small business exchange. In the context of immigration, there's been the deferral of uh, potential removal and deportation of uh, various categories of uh, 
uh, undocumented aliens. And so the question is, to what extent can the president uh, engage in such deferrals? And my starting point here in terms of precedence is the Supreme Court's opinion in Heckler v. Cheney in 85, in which the court started off by recognizing the reality that there's never been any agency in all of history that had the resources sufficient to uh, take seriously everything that was in the agency's jurisdiction. And so agencies have always had to do a lot of picking and choosing among uh, uh, competing priorities, and then went on to say that the, the, that, that process of, of uh, uh, selective enforcement, necessarily selective enforcement, uh, 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 is governed by a very complicated set of factors, most of which are totally unknown to judges, and hence something that judges should largely stay out of. And, and the court used that discussion as the predicate for announcing its presumption of unreviewability of agency action. And that's certainly going to be the main, uh, one of the main uh, parts of the defense that the White House will use in the actions that John Boehner is bringing through my, the, my able colleague, Jonathan Turley. Uh, um, I haven't talked to Jonathan, and by the way, I'm, I, about any of this, so I'm, I'm, these are my views and have nothing to do with his. Uh, 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 but in any event, that's going to be a big part of it. What, one of the questions that will raise, though, is, is does all of this actually fit on the inaction side? If it fits on the inaction side, then there's a presumption of unreviewability. It's going to be very hard for anybody to get the issue into any court. Some of these seem to verge over onto the action side. So, for instance, there's actually a process that you have to go through to become a member of the deferred category, one of the deferred categories in the world of, of immigration. And, and through that process, you get a documentation that reportedly allows you to, to work. That sounds more like action than inaction. And, and uh, that, that characterization process is going to be interesting to watch, because if it's action, then there's a presumption of reviewability. If it's inaction, there's a, a presumption of unreviewability. So that's going to be, if, if I were Jonathan, I'd be pushing very, very hard on those aspects that seem to be more action than inaction. And that ties functionally with the efforts on the Hill to pull the plug on appropriations to support some of these measures. If we are just talking about deferral of action based on inadequate resources, then of course pulling the plug on appropriations is totally ineffective. If, however, we're talking about uh, some form of action that actually requires commitment of resources, and as I understand the way the immigration deferral program works, uh, there's a there's hundred or so folks who are uh, committed to uh, reviewing these applications. And so the appropriations, plug pulling could be quite effective, uh, but of course that gets to the veto pen and how you package that with other pieces of legislation to try and avoid the veto pen, et cetera. But in any event, that's one set of issues. Uh, um, another set of issues is, uh, uh, arises under the Supreme Court's opinion in Norton versus Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance in 2004. And here, what the court was interpreting and applying was uh, Section 706.1 of the APA. Section 706.1 authorizes a court to require an agency to provide action unlawfully withheld or unreasonably delayed. And in Norton versus Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, the uh, alliance, the petitioners, tried to use 706.1 as a means of attacking an entire program uh, uh, where they thought there was unreasonable delay and unlawful withholding of action. And what the Supreme Court said is, no, it's not available for that purpose. It's available only for the extremely narrow purpose of uh, challenging a decision not to take a discrete action that is mandatory. So what would a discrete action be? Well, it, a discrete action might include implementing the employer mandate of the ACA or implementing the, the small business exchange. It certainly would, uh, in the immigration context, would not uh, apply to any of these uh, uh, broad 
uh, deferral actions uh, or deferral policies that had been announced by the agency. It would have to take the form of some attempt to force uh, the government to remove an alien, which of course would never have any chance of, of, of winning for a wide variety of reasons. So um, that's going to be a big player. That precedent will be a big player in, in the debate. Also, under that, uh, the, the law and the reality have diverged significantly for quite a few years, actually quite a few decades. Uh, uh, Congress routinely enacts statutes that have deadlines. Uh, and uh, there will be a statute that will, for instance, require an agency, one of them required an agency to issue 428 rules within 36 months. Um, uh, and of course, agencies don't comply with those statutes. Uh, uh, the, what the empirics show is that uh, agencies comply with somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. And there may be occasions when an agency chooses not to comply uh, for political reasons, uh, but most of the time they simply don't have the resources to comply. So the way that litigation goes, even when you can get by the Norton versus Southern Utah Wilderness uh, Alliance precedent, is the, the petitioner comes in and says the agency was supposed to have taken this action two years ago. They haven't taken it yet. The judge says, what's going on? The lawyer for the agency says, we haven't gotten around to it yet. We don't have the resources to get around to it at the moment. The judge says, go back and talk to your boss and give me a timeline. The, the lawyer goes back, talks to the boss, gives a timeline that would have it uh, a year uh, from then or two years from then, which would be a three or four years beyond the statute. And that's the way that litigation routinely works. You don't throw for somebody in jail because they're unable to comply with the totally unrealistic, ubiquitous uh, congressional deadlines. That's going to play a big role, I think, both, both the, the legal side of it and Norton versus Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, and perhaps more importantly, the empirics that, uh, and this is not you know, this has nothing to do with the Obama administration. This, is, this has been going on for at, at least 25 years now uh, 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 in many administrations of both parties and with lots of ideological bents. Uh, so that's going to be a biggie. Uh, the next one, of course, is standing. And I don't see any way in hell that a congressman gets standing in one of these cases or, or the entire Republican caucus gets standing, uh, uh, ironically, they're far more likely to get the four votes of the four liberals on the Supreme Court than the votes of the five conservatives. Though, of course, there have been those occasions when I've been distressed to see everybody just flip sides uh, uh, based on uh, more on their, their short-term political bent than uh, any long-term judicial philosophy. But if you read, you know, I, I uh, was just talking to Kristen, my co-author on a number of books today, but. She says, I, I, I get a little obsessed with standing law. I actually read the damn things. Unlike most people, I don't just throw them in the trash. Uh, uh, and and it, it's pretty damn clear. Uh, there are five conservative members of the Supreme Court that would say, no way in hell. And four liberals that might say yes, if they adhere to their generally announced principles in the field of, of standing. Now, that could change in some context. For instance, uh, one of the actions Jonathan's already filed on behalf of Boehner is uh, a, a challenge to adequacy of the appropriations to support certain actions that the administration has taken in the context of the ACA. And I have to say, I haven't gotten deep enough into the weeds to have any idea about the merits of that. I do think there is a somewhat better chance of a member of Congress or a coalition of members of Congress being given standing to challenge something where it's rooted in, in uh, um, uh, appropriations, failure to appropriate uh, uh, spending, unauthorized spending of appropriated funds than in, in the other contexts. Uh, uh, but even there, I think it's a long shot. And then what we've got is the actions by the states, and that's going to be very interesting to watch. There are 17 states so far that have, have filed actions challenging um, the various aspects of the immigration deferral policy. And Massachusetts versus EPA suggests the possibility that uh, the states might wind up with standing. 
when you read the majority opinion in Mass the EPA, it's pretty clear that the four liberals who would, are inclined to say yes to most standing requests uh, were induced by Justice Kennedy to say, well, our liberal approach applies only to um, states when states are injured in their sovereign capacity. And so we got uh, Justice Kennedy, who not surprisingly, you know, he's, he's always been a strong advocate of states' rights, uh, uh, joining up with the liberals and saying there was standing in that case for the state of Massachusetts. <coughs> Could states get similar standing on a similar, I don't know, because he, he, he actually, or he didn't write the opinion, but the opinion was written pretty narrowly to apply only when a federal action injures, uh, or inaction, injures a state's sovereign interests, and that in that case happened to be some land that the court found that Massachusetts had already lost as a result of uh, climate change, and you know, what will qualify as a state's injury to a state's sovereign interest sufficient to get Justice Kennedy to join the liberals in conferring standing on states to challenge the immigration deferral policies? I don't know. It's, to me, it's always going it, it, to it's, it's gonna be a fascinating thing to watch as an academic, and uh, I don't know how it's going to come out. I think there's a lot of hard issues. Thank you. Well, I have a simple question for you, and uh, if you don't find get, you get enough from this talk, I recommend you purchase this book. Is administrative law unlawful? Administrative law, I think, is the central civil rights question of our time. Many people understand it's a problem, but few, I think, understand how serious it is. We have seen a return to what used to be called absolute power the very power that constitutional law developed in order to prohibit. It's a return to a pre-constitutional mode of governance. Now, I should make clear at the outset, I am not arguing for a return to the past. On the contrary, we already have returned to the past. Administrative power restores the central constitutional danger that constitutional law was designed to defeat. I'm just gonna run through a few of the themes of my book. You can consider a sort of top 10 list uh, and uh, I'm happy to go into further detail later. First, a bis basic concept. Administrative power is extra legal. Well, what do I mean by this, extra legal? What I mean is that it binds not through law, but through other mechanisms. The Constitution, as we all know, establishes mechanisms for binding persons, for constraining them, for imposing the obligation of law. And those mechanisms are first, acts of Congress, and second, the acts of the courts in particular cases. Administrative power, however, binds through other mechanisms, a whole host of other mechanisms. And in this sense, it is extra legal. You could think of it as off-road driving. The Constitution lays out avenues for binding power, but the government likes to drive off-road, which is exhilarating, of course, if you're in the driver's seat, a little unnerving for the rest of us. Note that I'm not arguing uh, that Con uh, simply that this is unlawful or contrary to law. It's a slightly different argument, a more fundamental argument, rather that this sort of power is extra legal and that it, in that it binds or obliges through means other than law. Now that, that may be unlawful, but the point is not simply that administrative law is unlawful, rather it's extra legal. Second, a little bit of history. Administrative power revives absolute power. Now, this is not just name-calling. Roscoe Pound in the 30s, uh, and actually even a little bit earlier, repeatedly said administrative power is absolute. And he was engaged in name-calling because he didn't understand absolute power, and he wasn't really opposed to administrative power. He just wanted to trim some bits of it and create the, what the Germans called a Reichstadt. Uh, that's not the enterprise that I'm engaged in here. Rather, I think that... Uh, Abs um, administrative power is absolute in the same sense that, it's a that the advocates of prerogative power said it was absolute in the Middle Ages. The academics who defended monarchical power, particularly the prerogative power, defended it as extra-legal power. And this is what was de defeated 
in the 17th and 18th centuries through constitutional law. Kings liked to issue commands, proclamations, or regulations that would bind people without going through parliament. Parliament was inconvenience. They liked to adjudicate in their own tribunals, the prerogative they called them, not administrative tribunals, but they called them prerogative tribunals, not going through the courts of law. And this is what in the 17th century finally was defeated. But it's this mode of monarchical power through pr or prerogative power survived on the continent, uh, and particularly, of course, in Prussia. Prussia in the 17th century systematically converts the personal power of the king into the administrative power of the state bureaucracy. And Prussia became uh, the home for the great theorists of ad this administrative power, this continuation of absolute or extra legal power. And from there, it circled back to the United States and other common law countries. American progressives were discontent with representative government, and when they flocked to Germany in the thousands, they found what they were looking for, a mode of government that takes power out of representative institutions. Uh, just to give you a sense of the flavor of this, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, a leading lecturer on administrative power in the 1880s, uh, did not go to Germany, but he did teach himself bad German, and his lectures consist largely of watered down versions of what he read in the treatises, German treatises, Prussian treatises. And where he seems to be novel, it's, it's, that's just where his German wasn't good enough and he made a mistake in translating. Uh, this is, and this is the result of the scholarship of Robert Newald several decades ago. That wasn't my observation. Third point, administrative power is not modern but ancient. The justification for administrative power is often that it is a modern response to the complexities of modern society. It's all very modern, but it's not modern, in fact. It revives absolute power. For a thousand years, rulers have tried to evade ruling through the law and the courts, and whether you call it prerogative power or administrative power, it's an ancient and familiar threat. It's not so much a response to modernity as a symptom of a lust for power. So to say that administrative power is modern is like saying that monarchy is contemporary. Since 1914, obviously, progressives have said, oh, well, administrative power is modern. They, they, doubled, they doubled back there because they didn't want to admit it's Prussian anymore. But this is actually, an, it used to be quite familiar. This is an ancient mode of governance derived through Prussia. Fourth, turning to American law. Administrative power is unconstitutional. The US Constitution rejects extra legal lawmaking by placing legislative power in Congress. It rejects extra legal lawmaking, adjudication, by placing judicial power in the courts. What's more, and what's really long forgotten, alas, is that the US Constitution protects procedural rights, not merely to set standards for the courts, but perhaps even more primarily to preclude extra legal adjudication. The due process of law, for example, was not merely a standard for the courts, but was a means of barring administrative power. The notion of due process of law developed since the 14th century in the early due process statutes, and it is repeatedly used pr primarily to bar prerogative adjudications, or what we call administrative adjudications. It's only recently that we now pretend, oh, it doesn't fully apply in the administrative state, it only really applies in the courts. That's a gross evasion of our due process rights. Jury rights. Jury rights were not a standard just for the courts, but also to bar administrative power. So, so for example, uh, the earliest cases in the states in the 1880s on jury rights actually involve administrative tribunals in which statutes establishing administrative tribunals without juries are held unconstitutional. Half dozen times in New Hampshire and even earlier in New Jersey. So almost all procedural rights are actually barriers to administrative power. Fifth, administrative lawmaking is justified as delegated power, but this delegation is actually expressly barred by the Constitution. Cass Sunstein, my elegant and brilliant former colleague, asked where is delegation barred by the text? Well, in this instance, I think one actually needs to look at the text because the first substantive word of the Constitution is all legislative powers here and granted shall be vested in a Congress. If all legislative powers in Congress, they cannot be elsewhere. If the grant were merely permissive, not exclusive, there would be no reason for the word all. The word all bars delegation, or actually subdelegation. Six, the necessary and proper clause is trotted out to justify administrative power, but in fact it bars the rearrangement of government powers. It's usually said that this clause allows Congress to enact what's necessary and proper to carry out the government's powers in the abstract, hence the justification for administrative power. But in fact, if you read the Necessary and Proper Clause carefully, you'll see that it, it speaks of the powers as vested by the Constitution. In other words, it carefully avoids authorizing a rearrangement of powers. Seventh, 
Chevron deference is systematic bias. I think you should call it Chevron bias, which is the name of an article which I'll be posting in the SSRN later this week. Just Chevron, no, never think Chevron deference, Chevron bias. Why do I say this? It requires judges to defer to an agency's interpretation of authorizing statute, and m so much of the literature and the, and the cases focuses on the authorization of the statute. But where the government is a party in a case, Chevron pre-commits the judges to the government's legal position. This is systematic bias, and it violates the Fifth Amendment's due process law. Eighth, administrative power is not necessary. The standard justification for absolute power from the Middle Ages to the early modern era, James I and all that, was that it's necessary. The king declared its necessity. And this remains a standard justification throughout the 20th century. But is administrative law really necessary? That's an empirical question. And but we're pretty good at empirics these days. And thus far, after more than 100 years of administrative power in the United States, I have not seen any scientifically serious empirical evidence of its necessity. And by the way, the evidence needs to be detailed and textured. What do I mean by that? Suppose you could prove it was necessary in 1890. Does that mean it's necessary now? For, suppose you could prove it was necessary in 1930s. You know, who of us were alive in the 1930s? That's a long time ago. It's medieval. Um, Suppose you could show that it was necessary in 1990. That's a quarter of a century ago. Is it necessary now? The internet has happened. We have entirely different ways of learning and dealing with complexity than we did half a quarter of a century ago. What's more, we ne it needs to be textured as to its subject matter. For example, the licensing, I'm very interested in licensing of drugs and, and regulation of medicine. The licensing of one drug may be necessary. Does that show the necessity of licensing other drugs? New drugs and devices is not a scientifically serious uh, uh, category. That's not the way the reality is textured. That's a legal description that's far, far too broad. And we have embraced administrative power generally, but the evidence, if there is any, is not going to be general. It's going to be quite detailed. Those who depart from the Constitution on a theory of necessity have the burden of showing the necessity, and they haven't even made the effort thus far. Ninth, administrative power is justified with the living constitution. I won't bore you about the living constitution for long. You know more about it than I do, no doubt. But the living constitution note, and here I hope I can make some small contribution, entrenches what seemed innovative in the 1880s. That's not very living, so far as I can see. As to future constitutional change, of course, the living constitution opens up the possibility of change. But as to past change, such as administrative power, it entrench entrenches what was introduced in the 19th century. This is the entrenching constitution. Tenth, a final philosophic point, forgive me a little philosophy, but it's actually very relevant. What we should be focusing on is the principle of rule through law, not any principle of rule of law. Rule of law is nearly meaningless. It's connected to the German Reichstag, a form of administrative power. It permits anything authorized by law, maybe even anything that looks law-like, in which case more or less anything can float through that, th through that tunnel. The Constitution's principle is rule through law and through the courts of law. Rule of law is thus a distraction. Instead, we must demand rule through law. Now, what should be done about all of this? I must say I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists about this, and I'm going to close simply by emphasizing a small point I made at the end of my book. At the end of my book, I, notice, I note that there's no need for dramatic or all or nothing solutions. On the contrary, we can do this with step-by-step -step corrections. This will suffice. You know, faster may be better, but there's actually good reasons for moving deli very deliberately. And indeed, this would offer opportunities to explore and test alternatives to administrative power. But throughout, it seems important always to keep in mind that at stake is nothing less than the thousand-year common law effort to establish governance through and under law. In a brief century, administrative power has revived absolutism. And I don't mean this just in a, in, 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 as a metaphor. It's revived what used to be understood as absolutism, extra-legal power. It has restored a pre-constitutional extra-legal mode of governance. This is justified as a modern pragmatic response to society, but in fact, it is the recurring danger of absolutism. Thank you. OK. 
Okay, so uh, yesterday I was fascinated. I was walking around the exhibit hall uh, up the hill and got into a conversation with somebody about, uh, a couple of people actually, about, the, about administrative law now being on the New York bar. And someone else suggesting that if New York goes to the uniform bar exam, we had this discussion about whether administrative law would ever be part of the uniform bar exam. And they said, well, if it is, it will be as constitutional law. They'll just fold it into constitutional law because, of course, all administrative law is is constitutional law, right? And I thought to myself, that's not how I see the world. Um, and, you know, in, in listening to Phil's talk, uh, and, and there's much about Phil's book that I think is just absolutely marvelous, but at the same time, I look at what I see as the reality, at least going on in the courts, and, uh, you know, at least from the constitutional end of administrative law, um, it's, it, it strikes me as being both fascinating and yet ultimately, in, you know, of little practical value Whereas when I think about things like Chevron and State Farm Review and these little niggling points in the Administrative Procedure Act, that seems to be to be where all the practical action actually is. So let me elaborate a little bit. If your goal is to constrain or to curtail the reach of the modern administrative state, looking at recent case law from the Supreme Court in particular, I think you really have to turn if you want to seriously uh, reach an outcome uh, that yields practical benefits, you know, strikes down some administrative action on behalf of a client, um, I think you have to turn to a very case-by-case, -case, piecemeal administrative law kind of approach because the Supreme Court shows absolutely no serious appetite for using constitutional law to make more sweeping changes in the administrative state. Two cases in particular stand out for me, although I don't think they're the, the only ones that demonstrate this. Uh, the Free Enterprise Fund case is absolutely fascinating. That was the case in which we were talking about uh, the removal power with the public, ac public Company Accounting Oversight Board, or as I understand it, sometimes referred to as peekaboo, which always makes my students giggle. Um, so you have this absolutely beautiful majority opinion saying that the Sarbanes-Oxley Act violates the separation of powers principles of the Constitution uh, by limiting the president's removal power. Uh, but while the majority opinion is an absolutely beautiful exemplar of unitary executive, unitary executive theory in ju a judicial opinion, it stopped short of actually doing anything because of a lousy remedy. The only remedy that just Chief Justice Roberts and the majority of the court provided after declaring the statute unconstitutional was to say, well, we'll just strike these few words out of the Constitution. But in the meantime, everything that the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board has done since inception stays in place. Um, Justice Breyer had a lovely dissenting opinion uh, that itself I think was a model of functionalist reasoning that included an appendix that listed out all of the other similar agencies in the federal government that fit precisely the same model as the SEC peekaboo model. Um, and given the limited remedy that was provided by the majority, I sat there scratching my head saying who in their right mind would ever challenge an agency action again on separation of powers grounds trying to raise the same removal power argument against any of these different agencies and their actions if the only remedy is to strike out a couple of words in a statute while leaving the agency action in place. Um, another example of this, I think, is NFIB versus Sibelius, which uh, has, you know, a, it's a wonderful Commerce Clause opinion. Randy Barnett did the heroic job of convincing five justices of the Supreme Court that uh, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution did not support the individual mandate in the Affordable Care Act. But at the end of the day, we didn't really seem very far, you know, we didn't get very far in practical terms because Chief Justice Roberts was willing to say that uh, the individual mandate was a tax for statutory purposes so that we could actually consider the case, but use the constitutional avoidance canon to conclude that it wasn't a ta or that it was a tax for purposes of the Constitution and thereby fell under the taxing power. 
And again, I found myself scratching my head saying, we've got this wonderful Commerce Clause analogous, or, or, or analysis that constitutional or conservative constitutional scholars have been begging for, for for decades, and where did it get us? Maybe it'll get us somewhere down the road, but I don't really know. Um, I could go on. Noel Canning sort of fits this paradigm, I think, to some extent. Uh, the Amtrak case that's currently in front of the Supreme Court, I'm, you know, I look at, and uh, I was actually on a panel, a, a podcast discussion of it with some people before the oral argument in which all the panelists agreed. We may have disagreed about how the case ought to come out, but we all agreed that there are fundamental problems with privatization, uh, particularly of things like standard setting in the modern administrative state. People on all sides of the ideological spectrum can look at what's going on in that context and agree that there are serious legitimacy and rule of law concerns that are raised. And yet, um, I'm somewhat pessimistic that even if the Supreme Court manages to say something really eloquent about non-delegation and privatization in the modern administrative state in the Amtrak case, they'll find a way to limit it down in exactly the same way so that it achieves absolutely no practical result for the expansion of the modern administrative state. Um, which leads me back to administrative law. Um, the argument over how Chevron works and where Chevron ought to apply and ought not to apply resembles debates over how many angels you can fit on the head of a pin. And yet at the same time, not only do we not have a single Supreme Court justice embracing the idea of getting rid of Chevron, but instead we have, by my lights anyway, several recent opinions that show continued fascination on the Supreme Court's part for all of the little nuances of how Chevron works. And using Chevron step one or viewing Chevron step one as the pr one of the primary mm -hmm. vehicles for actually constraining administrative action. Um, a couple of cases in point here um, you know, there was the home concrete case from a couple of terms ago where I sat in on a fascinating discussion at oral argument about what ambiguity means and ambiguity in colloquial terms not meaning the same thing as ambiguity in Chevron terms, that ambiguous is now a judicial term of art and we have to figure out what it means. Um, you know, proceed, it followed by uh, a fairly aggressive analysis, I think, by Justice Breyer in applying Chevron step one to reject the agency's interpretation in that case. Last term, there was a case that I've heard alternatively labeled as Cuellar and also as, and I, I'm probably butchering this, this name, but Skialaba. It's an immigration case from last term, uh, which was fascinating. Justice Kagan wrote a three justice plurality uh, pointing out that the precise uh, phrase or the precise provision at issue in the case uh, was Janus faced in that it was internally different aspects of the provision were internally inconsistent with one another thus concluding well this means the statute's ambiguous we punt on to Chevron step two and in an extraordinarily fractured set of opinions you had four different opinions all reaching different conclusions but six different justices all agreed no that's not what ambiguity means at Chevron step one. In fact, when you have internal inconsistency at Chevron, in a statute, uh, Chevron's reference to traditional tools of statutory construction and the traditional role of the courts in construing statutes means that the court, courts need to employ those traditional tools, whatever scope of tools that represents, employ some set of traditional tools to find either some reconcilable meaning to that statute and decide the case at Chevron step one, or reach a conclusion that Congress affirmatively intended to delegate resolution of a definable issue to the agency in question. Um, you know, so again, a fairly robust and uh, you know, aggressive approach to Chevron step one, even if you eventually get to Chevron step two. There just seems to me, at least at the Supreme Court, those are just two examples, but it seems to me that they've decided step one of Chevron is where the action is, and they're willing to apply a fairly aggressive approach there, but they're not willing to reach any more broadly than that. 
case in point, city of Arlington. Um, but I can't go on without, uh, or can't leave the podium here without mentioning State Farm as well in hard look review. Uh, you know, after the Supreme Court decided the State Farm case uh, requiring contemporaneous justification of an agency's choices back in 1982 or 83, I forget which, um, the Supreme Court didn't come back to State Farm for quite a while. We've had two different State Farm cases uh, in the last, I guess now it's probably running on 10 years, but I think Fox Television was around 2008, and then Judah Lang versus Holder was 2012. It's a little bit more of a mixed bag because the government won the Fox Television case, but nevertheless, you see tremendous debate in both, you know, I think, and, and then the government lost in Judah Lang. Uh, but you see tremendous engagement by the justices on some level, both about what State Farm really entails and really requires, and a willingness by the justices on both sides of the ideological spectrum to dig in, I think, a little bit more deeply into those agency policy choices. We can debate as a normative matter whether State Farm and Chevron ought to be the tools that the Supreme Court uses to curtail the modern or constrain the modern administrative state, but those do seem to be the weapons of choice. Um, and I think that the main reason for that is because in either case, whether you're talking about Chevron or you're talking about State Farm, um, they're very, as grandiose and eloquent as the Supreme Court's analysis may get as theoretically nuanced as the Supreme Court's analysis may get, ultimately, uh, in Chevron cases, Congress can come back in and amend the statute, whether they will or not may be a debatable point as well, but they at least can. And in the State Farm context, if the agency loses, then the agency can come back and try again. Um, so at the end of the day, as con even though it, these doctrines serve, or the Supreme Court uses these doctrines to serve something of a constraining function, it's not one that puts the Supreme Court out there as making irrevocable, broadly sweeping decisions that can't be reversed by the more politically accountable branches. And that's why I think that those are the weapons of choice of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and why administrative law really isn't about constitutional law anymore, it's about these other doctrines. Um, Professor Hickman has argued uh, eloquently that sort of incrementalism is the name of the game, uh, and I subscribe wholeheartedly to that proposition. That's just another way, to my mind, of saying that we're living under the New Deal Constitution and that the Supreme Court will not unilaterally unravel that edifice. Um, to my mind, that reality urges a kind of pragmatic but constitutionally grounded realism. Um, I'll try to explain in my very brief comments why I think Kristen's point is worth heeding in the context of present and future litigation. And I'll then add sort of two observations that aim to flesh out but in no way detract from her central point. Um, why is it that this big versus incremental question matters, practically speaking? Uh, I think it matters, among other things, because this town teams with constitutional fundamentalists who say and write that the entire New Deal Constitution is unconstitutional from top to bottom, who believe deep down that the incrementalist game is not worth playing, and who sees on any case that comes along to ride their constitutional hobby horses in amicus briefs or otherwise. Uh, now, there is no harm, to my mind, in debating grand constitutional principles. In fact, I'll embrace that enterprise in a moment. Uh, but there is, at least potentially and in some contexts, uh, great harm or considerable harm in launching ill-conceived cases that uh, reassert such principle or try to, uh, and that sometimes come along with somewhat careless briefing and somewhat improvident claims, which then produce train wrecks and setbacks. I think that tendency is most pronounced in sort of grand constitutional cases, but it also surfaces in 
more ad lawish cases. So here's an example. Um, Non-delegation as a canon of construction. That idea did not spring from some constitutionalist's imagination. Ed Warren, who invented that theory, um, was no constitutional lawyer at all. Uh, he was a very, very good, superb administrative lawyer who needed some argument to persuade the court to adopt a very unnatural reading of a statute that, when taken in its natural meaning, made no sense at all and would have shut the country down. And non-delegation was that argument. It succeeded in the benzene case and then in some other cases, in the DC Circuit and so forth, until it died in Whitman. Uh, and among the many, many things that went wrong in that case was that several amici sort of seized on Justice Rehnquist's, then Justice, later Chief Justice Rehnquist's embrace of the non-delegation doctrine, and then argued in Whitman that the court should seize on that case to reassert the non-delegation principle and to overrule every delegation case since Schechter. Uh, the government's reply brief in that case contains a very fine paragraph which says, in substance, we respectfully submit to the court that the respondent's friends are crazy, um, which ought to tell the court something about this case, and so it did. Uh, it's not entirely clear, I think, uh, how much the over-the-top advocacy contributed to this mess, but it certainly didn't help. Uh, here's another example, more arguable perhaps, and I'm saying this with some diffidence, um, but what the heck, City of Arlington. Uh, I don't mean to be contentious or harsh, but reading the opinions, uh, including the dissent, I think it's fair to say that the courts or the justices did not consider the briefing or the oral argument for that matter as helpful as it might have been. Uh, among other things, the court was looking at three or four different theories as to what might or might not be jurisdictional. And that was a question that everybody knew or should have known should, would be coming. Uh, for present purposes, for my present purposes at any rate, the most telling sentence in the opinions is Justice Scalia's make no mistake remark. The petitioner's target is Chevron itself. And that response, too, was entirely predictable. And to meet it, I think you'd have to do one of two things. Either you explain why that is not your, edif uh, not your program, and you explain very, very clearly and very, very carefully how far you want this to go. Or else you stand by that enterprise, and then you explain what's really wrong with Chevron and what should take its place. And what's striking about the case is that neither of these things happened. And so the result was that Justice Scalia thought somebody was trying to pull a fast one on him. This was another wolf in sheep's clothing, and in the end, the dissenters didn't buy that particular piece of fleece either. Uh, again, I don't mean to be sort of contentious or overly critical. These cases are really, really hard to coordinate, and sensible people will disagree about the strategy. Um, but I think it's hard to deny that over the decades there has been a tendency to launch ill-conceived cases with sometimes careless briefing or overwrought claims. And then when these things go south, um, the more unhinged members of the blogosphere speculate about the non-compliant justices' motives and call them traitors or stooges for the administrative state. That isn't helpful in terms of incremental progress. It's also unbecoming. Uh, I think you can't cure that disease, but you can to some extent control its spread, and what that takes on the part of the lawyers in these cases is very careful pleading and a conscious effort to distance themselves from the more sort of wild-eyed claims. I think one of the cases Kirsten mentioned, Free Enterprise Fund, is a very good example of that. I think Bond versus United States is another instructive example. It's child's play to show that free enterprise at the end of the day does not really articulate a coherent theory. The real argument has to be that Humphrey's executor is wrong. And likewise, Bond fails to come to grips with the fact that there's something really wrong with the treaty power, uh, according to Missouri versus Holland. The full-throated overrule all of that um, arguments were um, presented to the court, but not by the lawyers. Uh, who very deliberately articulated a more incremental theory that then the court eventually adopted. And I think you'll see a lot of that pattern in future 
cases in King and in, in the litigation over Section 11, 111D, various pieces of Dodd-Frank, and so forth. Incremental progress in all of these cases, I think, depends on holding go-for-broke claims at bay. Uh, now, having snarled at constitutional fundamentalism, I'll now do the opposite and mount a qualified defense. Uh, in the right deployment, I think, it, it, that attitude strikes me as entirely constructive and, in fact, essentially even if you, is, especially if you are an incrementalist. Uh, and that's my two quick observations on Kristen's point. My first comment is that seemingly small, incremental, one-off rulings may have unexpected and very large consequences. So, two dozen law review articles published immediately after Prince vs. United States say two things, all of them. First, the anti-commandeering rule is an ill-advised throwback to discredited notions of dual federalism and constitutional formalism. Except for ill-advised and discredited, that is entirely correct. Um, second, these articles say, mercifully, it doesn't matter because Congress can always preempt or bribe the states. So good night. I don't think that today the authors would write the articles in quite that same way. Without Prince, there'd be no Section 1321 in the Affordable Care Act, and there would be no King versus Burwell and no Halbig versus Burwell. These constitutional acorns always look small until they look very big. You can't always sort of water and nurture them along because there's just too much contingency in the world. Um, Sometimes they just remain acorns or they die and that may well, very well happen to free enterprise fund. What do I know? Um, but it may also grow into an oak tree, um, just as Prince now overshadows a rather large piece of real estate. How might that happen? Well, I don't know. You never know. But the response, I don't think, is let's go for broke. The uh, response, I think, is to ramp up incrementalism and to sort of toss a lot of acorns out there. Uh, my second point is a little bit more belabored and theoretical. Um, there's a sensible distinction which Kristen has drawn between sort of big constitutional cases and smaller, more incremental ones, but I think there's also a crucial distinction between constitutional rules and the second order deployment of constitutional principles in the form of background norms or canons of construction. Lots of constitutional norms that are officially dead live on in the canons. And that is especially so in administrative law because, in fact, that is the essence of administrative law. So the New Deal version of administrative law is famously, as embodied in the APA, is famously a series of compromises. And the most fundamental compromise is this. We will no longer enforce constitutional norms directly as first order norms, but we'll give you substitutes. Do processes out, but you'll get procedure and you'll get a presumption of reviewability. The separation of powers is out, but we'll give you theory of institutional settlement. Federalism is out, but we'll give you clear statement rules. And the umbrella term for this, of course, is legal process. It's like Plato's cave. The Constitution is sort of the shadow on the wall. Um, now, to maneuver in that world, I think you have to know and remember things that were completely beyond uh, Felix Frankfurter's comprehension. Uh, you have to understand that you are dealing with shadows and you have to understand what they are shadows of. In other words, you have to understand the actual constitution, both its formalist features and its deeper logic, and I take that to be Philip Hamburger's project. Every quasi-constitutional argument in this domain will be underhanded in the sense that you cannot advocate the first order norm from which it's derived. That's the Constitution in exile or whatever. Um, but the arguments can't be nearly underhanded because they have to mimic the actual Constitution so far as you can. And to make that work, you have to be sort of a constitutionalist of sorts. You have to remember the real thing. Now, I'm open to the argument that all that mimicry and underhandedness isn't good enough, but the more immediate question to my mind is, what happens if you lose the connection between the constitutional shadows and the actual forms? Two things, I think, happen. One is, at one end, you wind up with doctrines that, while they're intended to capture some piece of the Constitution or some constitutional intuition, actually turn the darn thing on its head. State sovereign immunity is a doctrine like that. Preemption doctrine, as currently practiced, is another. And at the other end, you wind up defenseless against an ascendant position that says goodbye, not just to the Constitution, because that's water under the bridge, but even to the shadows. Um, so the overt nihilism that's become trendy in places like Harvard and Hyde Park, 
That's just an overblown version of a rather distressing attitude that has gone mainstream. So Justice Breyer's textbook still is nominally committed to the New Deal formula. So it says, sure, every administrative act must have an affirmative legal basis. That's the shadow of Article 1. But Justice Breyer's jurisprudence now says something very different. An agency can do anything that is not specifically prohibited and some things that are specifically prohibited. And alarmingly, that position now has four votes on the Supreme Court see the dissent in Utility Air Regulatory Group. To stem that drift, you have to re-articulate first principles and then translate them into constitutionally grounded administrative law canons. So again, a good incrementalist will have to be a constitutional fundamentalist of sorts, an administrative common lawyer after that. That's my practical proposition. For practical purposes, let's heed Kristen's uh, advice and forget about big, bold arguments that shake the foundations of the administrative state. Instead, let's dedicate ourselves to the articulation of underhanded, quasi-constitutional arguments and let Philip Hamburger remind us of what it is that we're being underhanded about. Well, our panelists have kept on exactly on time, and so now we have uh, a substantial uh, time for some interchange uh, between them, so I hope they'll take uh, five minutes uh, in order and react to uh, what the others have said. Uh, Dick Pierce. Well, I guess I just wanted to say a couple of things about Philip's uh, um, points. <clears throat> First of all, I really can't comment much about the 14th or 17th century because I was really quite young then. Um, uh, although some people, some of my students think that I actually was already teaching then. Uh, the, uh, uh, in terms of the modern administrative state, I, I simply don't recognize anything in Philip's description uh, as being relevant to anything I see around me or have seen around me for the last 70 some years. Uh, um, uh, I'm reminded of Eisenhower's statement shortly after he was inaugurated president that this was a hell of a demotion that he discovered he had only a small fraction of the power that he once had once he became president instead of supreme allied commander. Uh, that's far more consistent with my view of reality today and I think consistent with the view of everybody who's had the misfortune of, of uh, being elected president of the United States and getting stuck trying to figure out how to do something. Uh, um, uh, whether it's movement to the right, movement to the left, or movement in any direction. Uh, um, and then the, the other thing I'd say is I, I agree completely with Kristen's take uh, that, and, and I go a bit further and say, there is not a single justice of the Supreme Court, nor is there any person who could ever be nominated or confirmed to the Supreme Court who would accept any of the 10 propositions that uh, Philip laid out in his presentation. I, I, I don't think there's any chance of that going anywhere. And I certainly agree with Michael that you have to be at least cautious uh, about making such arguments. Uh, they, they can be extremely counterproductive in a world in which everybody else is debating other subjects that are only uh, orthogonally related to, in very complicated ways, to these big historic structural arguments. Me? Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, why don't I start by saying something about Dick's argument and then about the others. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The suggestion that there's nothing relevant about the prior development of administrative power, I think, uh, says less about my book than about the point of view of people who are deeply invested in administrative power and in writing about it. Uh, and I don't mean this in an aggressive sense, but it's just the reality. Uh, since 1914, the beginning of World War I, the advocates of administrative power systematically stopped reporting on their history. Up to that point, they celebrated its history and absolutism. They celebrated its Prussian origins. They thought this was a foundation of scientific, rational inquiry about law. Um, but then being German or having German origins became a little less tasteful, and it just dropped out of the books. Um, 
Landis in the 1930s knew all about this, and I can say with confidence he deliberately suppressed this information and tried to distract people from it. Nowadays, I don't think that's true. Now people just have forgotten. But that doesn't mean the history isn't relevant because it shows what administrative power really is. It isn't just a concoction of our society. It's something that has a history, and that means we can see it as a larger phenomenon of evading rule through law and through the courts. And it seems to me you ca one can't erase the history without actually losing some understanding. Now, I want to turn to uh, <coughs> the other arguments that were made here. Uh, Mike, I think, very aptly suggested that there's a danger of poor litigation. There's been a lot of very poorly framed litigation on the subject. Much of it is overstated, much of it's too ambitious, and much of it, above all, is spasmodic because companies, corporations, respond when they get hurt and they don't really think ahead. Uh, but this does not mean we should be throwing out constitutional law, let alone retreating to small-scale doctrine, what I call dainty steps litigation. Uh, this is just silly. Uh, first, constitutional law still matters. Uh, yes, we need something of a civil rights movement. Imagine if in 1954, the NAACP said, you know, let's just give up. You know, constitutional law doesn't favor us. This would, be, it would have been a disaster. Uh, the idea that one should just give up seems just odd put it mildly. Constitutional law, as Mike aptly noted, shows us the direction in which change should occur, and it also creates pressure for change. And one may not win on the broad arguments of constitutional law in particular cases, but if you don't, if you give up on the drumbeat of what constitutional law really is and why it matters and why administrative law is dangerous, and administrative power, I should say, is dangerous, then you will give up the moral force that actually sways the courts. Uh, and if you doubt me, let me just read to you from an opinion of the Supreme Court, November 10th. This is the Whitman case. If you do anything with the SEC and have a slight interest in this, I used to teach this stuff, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, Scalia and Thomas invited future cases precisely on the question of essentially ambidextrous enforcement and suggested that Chevron deference is not due in those cases. And how do they justify this? I doubt the government's pretensions to deference. They collide with the norm that legislators, not executive officers, define crimes. When King James I tried to create new crimes by royal command, the judges responded the king cannot create any offense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The 17th century is very much on the mind of some of the justices. Now, that turns to a second point uh, going beyond the throwing out of constitutional law. I want to get to the dainty steps litigation question. Uh, look, uh, there's no doubt that particular cases have to be litigated that way. You have to give judges, as Mike aptly, aptly noted, an opportunity to agree with you on the smallest possible foundation. However, um, this is a terrible long-term litigation strategy. In a particular case, it matters. Long-term, it's a disaster. This is why we could continue increases in administrative law. I'll be just one more minute. Uh, lawyers tend to defend case by case, and the corporations sometimes win and more often lose. They fight, as I tell my students, fight alone, die alone. Uh, what we need is coordinated litigation strategy against egregious doctrines. And let me suggest just some examples. Forfeitures, waivers, ambidextrous enforcement, as I suggested uh, before the court got to it, uh, Chevron bias, at least in cases where the government is a party in a case, and above all, the First Amendment cases that I tend to deal with. Uh, HHS actually censors academic speech. Most people don't know about it, but it's begging for litigation. So what I think is we, uh, what we need is actually to think ahead and not simply respond case by case. Thank you. Well, so I guess I'll just weigh in with this sort of three-way conversation that Michael and Philip and I have going about uh, incremental, about litigation strategy, basically. And one of the things, and, and I'm going to come back to the Amtrak case that I mentioned uh, in my talk earlier that's currently in front of the court. I mean, I, I, can, I agree with Michael that full-throated, you know, let's unwind the modern administrative state litigation uh, positions often end up undermining the very cause that they are purporting to uh, promote. Um, I also can be very sympathetic to Philip's argument that we shouldn't be too dainty and incremental in our litigation strategy, that some coordination to raise objections at a more theoretical level is useful, and in fact, that's what academics are for. 
Uh, and that's what amicus briefs by academics often are for and can be very useful to the courts in providing. Um, but one of the things that struck me in the conversations I've had about the current, the, the, the Association of American Railroads Amtrak case in front of the Supreme Court, which is a non-delegation case about privatization, is this continual drumbeat, uh, th this lament across the political spectrum in the academy that there's a, there is a real problem here that ought to be talked about and addressed. How much authority should non-governmental or quasi-governmental actors have to define standards that regulate other people against whom they are competing or whose interests are different from theirs uh, out in you know, the, the, the larger public? Uh, that's a very serious question with very fundamental uh, you know, rule of law and legitimacy concerns driving it. Uh, we may reach different conclusions, but it's a very much a debate worth having. The problem is that all of the effort in front of the Supreme Court right now to have that debate has gotten completely swamped in our current climate of right versus left ideological warfare and even to some degree, although Supreme Court briefs really typically aren't uncivil, nevertheless, nevertheless, the incivility that has encompassed so much of our society as we have these debates. And the lament that I have heard is this very real issue with very real theoretical uh, you know, substance to it is going, is, has, has gotten completely swept away by the ideological battering ram that, you know, tends to be litigation of this sort right now. So I'm a, I guess I'm a little bit pessimistic that we have the capacity right now for the kind of nuanced, coordinated, thoughtful debate that Philip envisions us having in litigation in front of the Supreme Court. Maybe we can have it in academic articles. But it, you know, it, it seems to me we, we're having a difficult time having that debate in the Supreme Court. And I'm not terribly optimistic that we can get there. I don't know how to get there, I guess, may be the better point. And maybe other smarter people than I am have a really good idea of how we can get past this current status quo. But that's where I think Michael's point comes in about the, the approach that we're taking in the litigation context, undermining the very goal that we're trying, at least as, as thoughtful academics, to achieve through real litigation. Um, just a few quick points. Uh, I shared some of uh, Kirsten's pessimism about um, <laughs> the potential for uh, nuance, at least in these big gargantuan uh, cases, you are king, those kinds of things. Um, I just, uh, on a more hopeful note, I think the Supreme Court very, very rarely, if ever, makes new administrative law doctrine in big cases. Uh, and so th there may be opportunities to sort of bring some rhyme or reason uh, to these matters uh, in smaller cases. Uh, what irritates me it, it, at the same time is, I mean, and maybe, look, maybe it's old age, you know, but I just can no longer get it up for Chevron metaphysics. And <laughs> Um, that, uh, and, and that seems to preoccupy a lot of people in the academy, a lot of administrative lawyers, a lot of people on the Supreme Court. Uh, another, it's, it's one more hopeful sign is I think um, the DC Circuit is still a different beast. Um, you can so cobble together very uh, uh, very unusual majorities uh, in in the in that particular forum. Um, just give you one example: uh, uh, the case Electric Power Supply Association versus FERC. It's a huge, huge, huge case um, uh, involving um, a FERC regulation um, that really stretches and strains uh, FERC's authority. Um, that was bipartisan in the D.C. Circuit. If that goes to the Supreme Court, I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, and one final note uh, is just 
I sympathize with Philip's point about strategy and all the rest of it, but if you watch this up close, it's actually amazing how little you can strategize in most of these cases. There are bazillion industry groups. Nobody controls the litigation agenda. Nobody can. They all have their own uh, particular access to grind. Even if they're all pull, sort of pulling in the same direction, it's a coordination problem on a massive scale. Um, and sometimes, yeah, it's true that there are sort of opportunities to file useful amicus briefs, um, but there are also um, opportunities to muck things up by way of amicus briefs. I mean, I had the, the lawyer who litigated the EPSA case um, teach it in my ad law class, and the students were all amazed, and it's sort of an interesting case in all sorts of ways. You can't tell whether it's a Chevron case or Chevron 1, 2, whether it's a state farm case, it all runs together, but it comes out right, and it, it's, it's very compelling. And the other thing, and they asked me, how did you do this? I mean, how did you sort of translate your approach to this into the actual outcome? And he says, you know, one of the things that helped me is that nobody else was paying attention. I was all on my own, and so I could fight this the way I wanted to without paying attention to a whole lot of uh, uh, people on the outside. So um, it's naturally that the, the NAACP comparison is not apt because those guys had a m litigation monopoly. It was either them or nobody else, nobody at all. Administrative law is a completely different kettle of fish. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, if uh, we now have time for questions, and while people line up uh, to ask them, I will uh, begin by asking uh, a question. But please come to the microphone and then identify yourselves. Uh, we've had much discussion of the uh, judicial influence on the course of administrative law, but as I understand it, uh, tomorrow uh, there'll be a new Congress in place, and a new Congress that will be very differently uh, situated from any Congress, I think, since uh, the New Deal in certain ways, and having, I think, a larger uh, Republican uh, contingent uh, in the House since the New Deal. Uh, what opportunities are there for Congress to engage in change? Uh, let me give some examples that have already been going on in proposals in Congress. Uh, Michael Grieve suggested that we want to think of shadows of Supreme Court uh, of constitutional doctrine. The non-delegation doctrine is an excellent example of that that he gave. And as I understand it, in Congress there is a bill uh, pending uh, that would require that Congress itself uh, pass into law any significant laws, laws that would have over a billion dollars of effect. Uh, is that, would that be a useful uh, move? Uh, moreover, of course, Chevron is ultimately a matter of congressional intent. One could have framework statutes or statutes that are passed about particular agencies that take away Chevron deference. Now, of course, these are likely now to be vetoed uh, by this current president, <laughs> but that does not mean that they would be not important parts of uh, uh, changing um, uh, administrative law. They would then become on the shelf uh, for at times when they might not be vetoed by a president. And moreover, uh, when we talk about the Supreme Court, any realist of the Supreme Court understands that the Supreme Court is going to be taking some signals uh, from what uh, Congress is doing. So is my question, is there an opportunity in this way uh, for the new Congress coming in uh, to respond to some of the excesses, at least, of administrative, uh, the administrative power that Philip has uh, suggested? Any responses to that? A little shot. Um, first of all, I'm very skeptical of the Reins Act. So much could be used to it, so much could be done to evade it. I don't think it would have any effect. And what's more, it accepts administrative power as lawful. Uh, my own proposals that I've made in the past include things such as simply adopting some regs, a statute, step by step, agency by agency. You don't have to do much. You just take a tiny little agency that's not terribly significant, who's, the regs of which don't change very often, adopt them as statute, and cut off more regulation making just as an experiment. It's an empirical approach to see, will the sky fall if you do this? And if not, then you can take another small agency. None of this has to be done in some uh, dramatic way. And I think that would be, those would be useful measures. Uh, similarly, I, um, officer liability without any special immunity, 
would probably be a good thing for some agencies. The IRS comes to mind, but I'm sure everyone has their favorite. I don't see Congress doing much of anything. Uh, I can think they'll, it, it's gonna be a different Congress in the sense that we're not going to see two vetoes. We'll probably see 30, 40 vetoes and then a whole lot of, of actions not taken because of the likelihood they would be vetoed and hence they're viewed as, as exercises in futility. So I, I don't see much of anything. And I, tinkering with delegate, with, with, with deference doctrines is, uh, I, I think that's really kind of silly. Uh, angels on the head of a pin is, is, is a good analogy. Uh, I do a lot of empirical work. So our deference, I had a big debate with the Solicitor General recently, a couple of hours, uh, where uh, he says, oh, our deference, we always win under our. I said, that's crap. You win 76% of the time under our, 72% of the time under Chevron, 68% of the time under Skidmore, and 64% of the time when the courts say they're not giving any deference. So we're talking about, you know, a percentage, we're talking rounding errors, for God's sake, and all these. You, we have to teach this to our students because you have to give them the vocabulary that the courts expect them to use in litigation. It is quite another thing to think that the vocabulary has much to do with outcomes. Can I, can I just uh, res, uh, add one thought to that? I, I think Dick's absolutely right on, on some of this, but the rules that one has on deference affect a whole host of cases that aren't litigated or not litigated very far. And so it seems to me there's a lot at stake in this, even though I fully agree with him in the particular cases that come up to the, to the higher courts, it does matter. I will just add the view that I tend to agree that Congress probably won't do any of this, but even if they do some of it, one of the things that struck me in the past is that even when they uh, try to enact legislation to constrain procedurally uh, through, you know, agencies procedurally one way or another, um, the enforcement mechanisms are sufficiently lacking that they have, they have at best symbolic value. Uh, so consequently, the RAINS Act sounds very, very nice, at least in theory, uh, but at the same time, I don't, even if it could get past a veto, I just don't see it having the kind of practical impact that people think that it will. I think it will largely be ignored. Um, you know, m maybe I'm wrong about that, but so that doesn't really give me much, you know, I don't think much of that potential. Um. I don't know, I don't have any firm opinions on what Congress is likely to do or not. Uh, my only note of caution is that um, there's a limit to the, uh, to the extent to which sort of procedural fixes um, can take care of the discontents that many people in this room uh, harbor. It's of no comfort to me um, that things might be done in a more orderly and accountable fashion. I think the Affordable Care Act is a flaming disaster, or would be a flaming disaster, even if everything were in good order there, legally speaking, which it's not. Okay, uh, questions from the audience? Thanks, uh, Jack Bierman from Boston University. Uh, I have a question, and I'll make a, a very short little explanation of why I think it's an important question in this context, and it's really um, about uh, Phil's general theory, why isn't everything that you're arguing about answered just by eliminating deference? And the reason I say it is because you're, I don't, I don't, I can't even imagine the form of government that you're presenting as an alternative to the one that we have under our Constitution. And the reason I say it is because you're right that the word all is in the clause about the legislative power, but the word herein is also in that also, I believe. And the, uh, there's also Article 2 and Article 3, and especially Article 2, the Take Care Clause, which says that the President's primary constitutional duty is to take care that the laws made by Congress are faithfully executed. And there's also a reference in the Constitution to departments of government, which implicitly, at least by the Opinions Clause, seems to, me, seems to anticipate some independent uh, existence of these departments. So I, I don't, I, I guess, I guess, um, the only thing I would disagree with Dick about is when he says that none, that no judge who agrees with any of Phil's ten statements could be confirmed. Because I think I would hope that one who dis, would disavow Chevron could be confirmed. Um, so uh, it um, it seems to me that it's under our current constitutional law, only courts can issue binding judgments, which means that 
administrative agencies can't adjudicate under the Article Three, and only Congress can put <coughs> words into the statute book or into the U.S. Code, which means only Congress can exercise the federal legislative power. And that seems to me to be just black letter, basic constitutional understanding. So I think if you if you just eliminate deference, you've got everything that you're complaining about, unless you're envisioning some sort of totally different form of government, which is not provided for by our Constitution. Thank you very much. Uh, it seems to me that it may depend on what we mean by deference. Uh, if we're just talking about Chevron, Chevron deference, no, I don't, I don't think getting rid of that would be enough. Um, and by the way, I do think it's actually a fairly vulnerable doctrine as revealed by Scalia's attempt to retreat from elements of it this fall. Uh, but if we're talking about deference on a larger scale, uh, the deference, for example, to the making of binding rules and binding guidance and so forth, uh, eliminating deference would get one very far. Uh, but that's a broader understanding of deference, isn't it? I, I just come back to there's way too much focus on deference uh, and certainly way too much focus on Chevron. I would remind people the most full-throated defense of, of Chevron was by Justice Scalia in 1987 concurring opinion. The most full-throated criticism of Chevron was by Justice Breyer in several opinions. Uh, the two of them are on polar extremes on Chevron and opposite polar extremes in terms of the empirics of how often they vote to uphold government action. These doctrines have virtually nothing, and the idea of no deference, I mean, in a sense, that's what Skidmore says, we'll give it as much deference as it deserves. Okay? I mean, you're not going to ignore the government's position. You're not going to ignore the position taken by some agency that sometimes they only put 10 hours, sometimes they put thousands of hours into it. You're not going to ignore that. It doesn't matter whether you say you're ignoring it. You're not going to ignore it. Can I just come in on this just for one second? Okay. Sure. Uh, so it seems to me the question we were discussing is much broader than, than Chevron, right? There's a deference to a whole host of administrative powers, and to focus on Chevron is a mistake, but I think for reasons other than you were following. And uh, none of us, I think, are arguing that a court should ever ignore uh, the position of any party, and the parties inevitably will be bringing to the fore the government's interpretation. It's not about not considering the government's position, uh, legal position, but not giving it greater consideration than other parties. Hi, I'm Randy Barnett from Georgetown Law. My comment is really about Michael's uh, talk. Michael, you've never given a talk with which I agreed with more than the talk you gave this morning. It was, it was really remarkable. I'm making progress. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I'm just trying to figure out who your uh, opponent is, who your target is uh, for your talk. I mean, your, your advice was, was very, very sensible and sound. On the one hand, lawyers make incremental arguments because you need to give courts something that they're capable and likely to rule in your favor about. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of the two cases, not, this is not ad law cases, maybe all your targets are in the ad law world that I'm just unfamiliar with, but you know, in the Rage case, we never argued about, uh, to do anything radical in the case, we never argued that Wickard versus Filburn uh, should be repealed. We had one sentence in which we said, if the court thinks it's necessary, then they should reverse it, but that was solely for Justice Thomas, because if you don't put that sentence in, then he won't he won't rule for you, so you have to have that sentence in there. The party has to ask. So we asked, one sentence. Uh, in the uh, NFIB case, um, we, our, our legal position was always uh, that if we should prevail, uh, there was only one law in the history of the United States that would be in constitutional doubt, and that is the Affordable Care Act. Uh, no other law that's ever been passed would have uh, breached this principle, and no other law that would ever be passed in the future would. That's if we'd won every single thing down the line. That's all we were asking for, which is, Partly why we got four, we actually got five votes on that proposition and four votes to do the whole, th to do the whole thing. It was all argued incrementally. Um, I can't think of a major case in which lawyers don't argue incrementally if they can. Uh, uh, so there's that. On the other hand, you, you wisely counsel that we need to keep in mind the original constitution, the big picture constitution, because that is that has the gravitational force that's going to pull justice, that's the term I've used, that's going to pull justices in, the, in an incremental direction that you like as opposed to an incremental direction that you don't like. 
uh, is the reason why. I mean, if you ha in fact, we're talking about a lost constitution or a constitution in exile or whatever, a big picture, real hardwired written constitution that's being ignored. That's what gets four justices to take your incrementalist approach in the NFIB case and a fifth one to acknowledge that you're right, but we're gonna, he's gonna go the other way. So you've got academics doing one, you've got lawyers doing the other, informed by the academics. I don't see who's not doing, who's not playing by the rules. You mentioned the bloggers. Now the bloggers you say are out there and they're excoriating some justices for being traitors and stuff. Look, if justices are reading the blogosphere and hearing that they're being excoriated for being traitors, they're probably also reading the, the New Republic and hearing that they would be abandoning their judicial conservatism if they were to uh, rule one way or another. And, uh, and those justices <clears throat> really ought to hear from the right what the right thinks about them because those justices, if there are any such justices, are certainly listening to what the left thinks about them. And so there needs to be an ideological clash of the kind that Kristen is talking about. In fact, that's, I think, what's the cause of the ideological uh, 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 world in which we live in is that we actually have two sides. So I just want to know, from, uh, we have two sides that are arguing now, whereas before we only had one. So I just want to know from Michael, I mean, I agreed with everything you said. Who doesn't agree with everything you said? Uh, in theory, they do. Uh, look, I agree that there's been sort of a learning process since, let's say, I mean, over the past 15 years, right? Whitman was a real debacle uh, in terms of uh, the, the advocacy that, that came along. Uh, that's one. Um, I'll say, two, I entirely agree that there ought to be sort of a firm and uh, sensible debate about what the Supreme Court has done in any particular cases. Having said that, um, I believe that some of the things that showed up on the blogs um, after NFIB about the chief were not just critical, they were completely over the top disrespectful and completely uncalled for. And I'll say the third thing about that case, I think people should have seen the tax argument coming, but that's a very difficult argument and a long, long, long um, debate. Uh, look, it, I, it, I, l let me put it this way. Um, I, I think, yeah, it, it, this tendency does, it happens in amicus briefs in particular, and it happens quite frequently, uh, I think, in sort of administrative cases where you have to take enormous care uh, to get these cases right. So look at the King briefs, right? There are some of the briefs where you say, Ooh, oh, I wish that hadn't been filed. Um, look at, if you want to go forward, uh, briefs that will be coming in, in the Dodd-Frank litigation. There will be briefs where you say, oh man, I wish that hadn't been filed. That'll be true of the 111D litigation and so on and so forth. So I'm, Randy, if my remarks were addressed, addressed to a null set, to a non-existing crowd, I'm thrilled, <laughs> terrific. Um, but it, 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 if, if there's one sort of conclusion is the academic world where these arguments make total sense and have to be made and the stuff has to be discussed on the one hand, and the litigation world on the other. That's a difficult coordination problem and we haven't always gotten it right. Uh, Michael O'Shea, Oklahoma City University School of Law. My question is related to Randy's and is also directed at Michael, um, though it relates to some of the things that Kristen was suggesting about incrementalism. Um, and the question is basically how to minimize the collateral damage to other legal doctrines that's produced by having to litigate in this indirect way that Michael described. I thought the description of the indirection that characterizes how academics and lawyers and judges really have to think about structural constitutional limits uh, was very perspicuous. Uh, that, that seems right. The problem is um, it relies frequently on using other subconstitutional or statutory doctrines to reach a result that really in our heart of hearts is, we know, is produced by a constitutional norm that the courts aren't willing to explicitly invoke. And 
The problem is the resulting opinions, right, are premised, are, are, are promulgated on the premise that these opinions are really about the doctrines that they're using. And so the collateral damage I have in mind is when you have what seems like a, an unpersuasive or highly strained application of a particular doctrine because we're doing shadow structural constitutionalism, but then that becomes citable in other contexts. And th this is not an exotic point, but just as a couple of examples, Bond seems like a good example of that, right? The, uh, I found it very difficult to, I agree that if the statute had been ambiguous, there would have been a strong argument for interpreting it the way the court did under the canon of constitutional avoidance. It was very difficult to see the ambiguity, um, as some of the other conservative justices pointed out. And now you have kind of a wild precedent out there for when courts can decide a statute is ambiguous. Um, Although it was a constitutional case, you could read NFIB that way and say the price of getting a sound uh, commerce clause and indeed spending clause holding was uh, we had to reach a result under the taxing power. I agree this isn't the time and place to relitigate that. I'll just say it wasn't even the view that it was a tax that I felt it was so hard for some to wrap their heads around. But why on earth isn't it a direct tax subject to the uh, apportionment requirement and therefore just as unconstitutional, but it's not and now you have this taxing precedent out there So you get the uh, there, you know more provocatively some people might read King that way are the Justices not going to cut this statute much of a break because in their heart of hearts a lot of them think we should have struck that thing down because it's it's real problem is it's unconstitutional so that's the scenario Okay, it is how do you count the costs of that and what can be done to minimize them? Thanks. Um, it's a terrific question um, and a very vexing one uh, and a very difficult one. Uh, I would have sort of approached the, the, the NFIB piece of this um, a little differently. I, for one, cannot make heads or tails of the spending clause jazz. I think that's sort of a second order rule that, to my mind, makes no sense at all. Um, and it is entirely possible uh, that on the way of, sort of by way of translation from first order norms to sort of second order interpretive norms, canons, doctrines, what call you what it will, you're gonna make mistakes, right? And, and I have no better answer um, than to say you have to bear in mind that I mean, you have to bear in mind what it is that you're trying to mimic or replicate here. That's the only answer I can give you. Um, I take your point about the sort of bizarre consequences that you can get from the doctrines. And mind you, some of the early, um, uh, the, the early adjustments post New Deal were like that, right? I mean, the New Dealers tried to salvage, I mean, first you expand the Commerce Clause to the wazoo, right? Anything goes. And then you try to salvage the states. And those doctrines look crazier than, I mean, what you had in, in, in the first place. Uh, and they've done great damage to the architecture. So yeah, the danger is real enough. That's why you have to have a really good understanding both of the, of the Constitution itself and sort of of the translation. That's the best answer I can give. We only have a... Uh, uh less than 12 minutes for three questions. So if we could have brief uh, uh, questions and then uh, relatively brief uh, answers, yeah. thanks. This will be a fairly short. Paul Kamen, our former clinical professor, George Mason, and senior fellow of the Administrative Conference, regarding, I guess, to Professor Hickman or anybody else on the panel, Chevron deference, Chevron bias, uh, it's an, an incrementalization of changing that. Um, as we know, Chevron was based uh, basically on the political accountability of the agencies. There's some scholarship out there um, including by then Dean Elena Kagan in 2001, that there should be less deference for independent agencies because they're less accountable to the executive. Do you think there may be approach in terms of bringing those kinds of cases in terms of trying to chip away at the uh, Chevron deference? Well, I actually think rather than the political accountability point, I think political accountability is, I think it's fairly, to me it's fairly clear from the jurisprudence, Meade, foremost among them, that uh, it's actually congressional delegation that's driving 
Chevron deference, the political accountability point is the reason, at least one reason in theory why Congress would delegate. Um, it seems to me that if you uh, accept the delegation premise of Meade, um, and I think the Supreme Court is not showing any signs of backing away from that, notwithstanding Justice Scalia's continued objections, um, that congressional delegations to independent agencies are just as deliberate as congressional delegations to executive branch agencies. Uh, so at least as a matter of Chevron theory, I don't think there's necessarily a basis for arguing that independent agencies ought to be different. There may be some other sort of separation of powers argument that you could make, but that then gets back into this argument about whether that should be an argument that you should make. Um, so there you have it. Next. Uh, yes, I'm Ron Levin from Washington University in St. Louis. I'll just have a quick uh, self-serving plug and a quick uh, comment on uh, uh, Mike's point. The self-serving plug, which I wasn't going to raise, uh, but I will because the RAINS Act was mentioned. I've just submitted an article to the GW Law Review on the RAINS Act. I once was asked at a congressional hearing, what do you think of the RAINS Act? And I said, I think it's the wor one of the worst ideas I've ever heard of. Um, and I adhere to that position, except that I've heard of a lot of really bad ideas otherwise. So <laughs> maybe the comparison isn't right, but the thrust is, and that will be the argument which you'll see published soon. But, but that is just a plug. So uh, I wanted to respond to Randy, I guess, because he asked, how can anybody disagree with Mike? And I'm going to offer a contrasting perspective on Mike's point, uh, which I took to be, uh, look, give up on this sweeping constitutionally based theory and focused on the quasi-constitutional uh, arguments, the ones that are, that are shadow replicas of the constitutional values. And I think maybe there's an argument to be made that really the better strategy from people who want to contest administrative action is to do neither of those things but to extend Kristen's argument and pursue types of challenges to agency action that don't really purport to be or can't and meaningfully be described as derived from a constitutional value, but nevertheless seem to work uh, in important ways. And I've done my share of writing on Chevron, but I, I don't want to, we don't want to go into that one any further, I think. Uh, but that, aside from that, what about state farm type hard look review? I know Dick is not a fan of it, but it, as a descriptive matter, uh, it is a potent weapon for litigants to argue the technocratic rationality uh, of, a, of a decision is deficient. You can win on those things. And it has some relation to, to traditional uh, uh, substantive due process review, but basically it's something autonomous on its own terms uh, outside the constitutional realm. OIRA review, a very potent restraint on administrative action. Again, it has some connection to uh, the president's power to supervise, but it's become somewhat autonomous as a bureaucratic rationality uh, device that you can defend, and probably would defend, less on constitutional grounds, but on grounds that it just improves the process. Uh, the, the Chenery Doctrine, uh, Kevin Stack was here earlier, no longer is, I think, uh, and he argued that it is constitutionally based. I have not seen a lot of uh, people rushing to agree with that proposition, but Chenery itself or more broadly, reasoned decision-making analysis. Quite a powerful weapon in the armory, but not, I think, really a constitutional argument. Um, and finally, just to tie this back to the discussion we were having about uh, the Affordable Care Act and immigration waiver programs, that may or may not succeed, but maybe the more productive argument is if you can't get waivers uh, disapproved, what structures, what decisional uh, mechanisms should be instituted to have them work out rationally, the kind of argument that David Barron and Todd Rakoff argued for recently might actually be more fruitful. So I don't think this is necessarily an all or nothing set of agendas, but I think that to a degree, maybe the, uh, the way forward is not the constitutional litigation, not the quasi-litigation constitutional litigation, but the other than constitutional set of tools in the toolbox. I'm not against that. <laughs> Let's hear it for Business Roundtable. 
Um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm all uh, on, on board with that. Um, the, the note of caution, I mean, or by way of defense, I would say this. Uh, I think the charming utopian belief in reasoned decision making to which everybody was committed in the 1980s and then in the 90s has collapsed on all hands. Nobody believes that anymore. Um, and one of the and, and the current contretemps and commotion over administrative law illustrates that I think very very powerfully. Uh, and so I think um, agencies are now pushing very very hard at the very outer boundaries uh, of their um, authority under more and more common. Uh, invocation of very exotic doctrines from absurdity to step by step, you know, made for litigation and all the rest of it. Once you confront that reality, you really have to bear the constitutional background norms in mind. Bureaucratic rationality won't get you halfway there. Hi. Um, so uh, I'm going to do two things here. First of all, um, I just want to thank everybody because I think this is our last session where we're all going to be assembled together. So I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank all of our speakers. And I also want to thank the faculty division staff and, and our other people who have been helping out. So uh, Anthony Deerdorf, uh, Tyler Lowe, Jandy Hegan, and our fine intern, Alan, uh, as well as our uh, new, uh, the new person who is just joining us, Joan Marie DeVoli. So thanks, everybody. And also Daniel Richards, uh, who has been uh, helping out with social media things, and also the hotel staff, who I think have done a terrific job. So thanks, everybody. Also to, to, to um, several people who are here who helped us put the program together, uh, John McGinnis uh, and, and, and Randy Barnett, um, uh, you know, who have always been helpful in guiding us in, in pulling this together, and uh, I think have done a, did an exceptional job this year as well. Um, so thank you guys. Um, I, I have actually two questions for Phil, uh, and I, I, I'm, uh, they both have to do with the Constitution. Um, one of them is this whole problem of the mechanisms through which executive decisions get made versus when they are when they become legislative, um, which I'm sure you know, or or, or when they become when adjudicative decisions become judicial part of the judicial power. In other words, just because something takes the form of a rule or takes the form of an adjudication, does that necessarily make it non-executive? Is there some scope in the Constitution for executive discretion? Seems to me there, there very likely is in domestic affairs. And so then it seems to me that your project has to include a mechanism for drawing the line. Um, the second one is sort of a constitutional problem, which is the I think Madison expected ambition to counteract ambition, and the legislative branch hasn't functioned that way as a practical matter. And it seems to me that that's also very hard to fix. So I think these are both, you know, significant issues for this project. Just very, very quickly, um, I, I quite agree the, the form question is interesting. Uh, look, when an agency engages in all of the apparatus of judicial form, but does not bind anybody uh, there's no reason to think that it's usurping judicial power. On the other hand, uh, whether or not it engages in the form of, uh, of a forms of a court, if it is, bind if it is binding uh, somebody, uh, then yes, there is, in the sense of constraining them, then it seems to me they are engaging in judicial power. As to Madison, I'm very, I'm very skeptical about looking to Madison to explain much of anything in the Constitution. He actually lost in most of the debates of what the Constitution should look, should look like, and so his justifications for adopting the Constitution never weigh that much with me. But yes, the country has changed dramatically, I think actually in ways that require us to abandon so much constraint. Perhaps we needed all this constraint, exact constraint in the 1930s, maybe, I doubt it. But certainly now, in an age in which we are much more diverse, in which we have so much more communication of other ways of learning how to act and interact, uh, it seems to me administrative law looks like a dinosaur. Well, 
thank you very much. And thank to, please thank all our panelists. <laughs>